This program is underwritten by Sustainable Settings, a nonprofit organization devoted to harvesting nature's intelligence in its research and demonstration of sustainable human settlement. Sustainable Settings is supported by volunteering, the sale of our organic farm products, and your tax-deductible donation. Call 970-963-6107 and visit us on the web at www.sustainablesettings.org. <laughs> on the way down here, we talked about um, creating order in things or encouraging uh, co-creating, I think, is a better way to put it, a sense of order as it has to do with rain and moisture. And, and uh, I found that fascinating, and I'd love to share that with the viewers. Well, you, you look at what happens in nature. Now, I live about two hours from Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia has a historical record that it is 20% more likely to rain on Saturday or Sunday or both than to rain on any of the weekdays. Hmm. But any of the weekdays, people are out on the highways going to work or coming home from work right at the sunrise sunset rhythm of the day inhale exhale well they're exhaling petroleum carbon yeah oily stuff yeah and that's going off in a cloud uh, and this is chaos you know molecular motion at random mm -hmm. but it's going off in a cloud above the highways that ring Atlanta and feed Atlanta. Okay. And that happens in the morning, and it happens again in the evening. Okay, so there's five days of that in yeah. the commute. Yeah, and then on your barbecue, it's liable to rain. Okay, on the weekends. And yeah. So what, where, is it, where are you going with that? Well, we're capable enough of stopping the rain... We, so, can, we can keep it from raining. We're doing a pretty good job of that. So we're doing it by the weekly inputs and the driving. You're saying we're oh, the, yeah, holding the, rain back or somehow. Well, we're turning the particulate matter in the atmosphere. We're coating it with oily substances. Emissions. Yeah, emissions. Okay. And so yeah. on the weekend, what happens? There's not as much of that at all. There's sort of a breath of fresh air. So it builds up, in a way, during the week is what you're getting at. Right, right. I mean, uh, the Weather Service explained this in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, that this was because the particulate matter in the atmosphere built up through the week. Now... In a sense, this is correct. It did build up through the week. But then it would rain on Saturday and Sunday. Why? Why Saturday and Sunday, see? Yeah. Uh, so they were saying that it rained on Saturday and Sunday because it had built up too much during the week. But how come it didn't rain on Fridays or Thursdays? Mm-hmm. And reach some kind of threshold where it broke. Yeah, yeah, okay. you might have thought it might do a little bit more of that. Okay, so... But, but the observation, like, I'm not talking about weather predic prediction. This is weather observation, which is a pretty exact science. Okay. So what's happening? Well, we're, we're actually... Uh, 
creating, and you can see it. You can come come into Atlanta. Like the inversion from, layers, that thing? Yeah, you can see this sort of dome of haze, and this yeah. is a common phenomenon around a lot of cities. Yeah. Yeah. And in those kinds of hazy conditions like that, you don't get cloud formation. If you were a buzzard, you'd steer clear of there. Okay, wait now. So it's disorganization. Oh, sure enough. Right, yeah. it's chaos. That's right, it's, it's chaos. Right. Yeah, you're creating chaos and for it to in rain, that pollution. For it to rain, it takes organization. Yeah, exactly. Okay. You know, I mean, what is the raindrop? It has coalesced. And the moisture in the atmosphere has built it up. And it hits the earth. In other words, the moisture in the atmosphere is organized. Mm. The rain process is a process of organizing moisture in the atmosphere. Okay. All right. Now, let's take that and imagine that you know, we've had, we haven't had rain for a month out here, right? We're high and dry okay. here in the Rockies. And so, <clears throat> you know, 17 to 20 inches of rain is an annual, is our annual precipitation if you take it across the year. So let's just say it's been 30, 40, 60 days, and maybe we want to encourage, if we could, for it to rain. Is there a way to do that? Oh, sure. Uh, help us out. Help us well, out. <laughs> well, it helps to see what's going on. Okay. So observation, really, that's the basis of intelligence. Okay. So. Make it rain, Hugh. Well, yeah, but I'm just saying you got to see what's going on if you're going to do all this. All right, all right. You know, because really, if you work with nature, then things work. You know, because nature does the work. Yeah. Uh, if you work uh, counter to nature, then it's expensive. <laughs> well, as we know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. it's really costly. So we mine nature uh, and abuse it to try to correct our uh, disconnection, We basically. sure have a curious way to treat nature. Yeah. Uh, All right, let's make it rain. Help me, help us okay, go there. Okay, well, okay. In your little spot on earth, okay. like within the boundaries of your property, yep. you have got an entitlement to affect that area the way you want. My eye... You mean? Is that my yeah. responsibility? Yeah, yeah. You can you can go out there and spray it with poisons. Well, that's a le mean, that's legal. That's legal. Yeah. <laughs> Re amazing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but it's legal. You yeah, could do yeah, that if you yeah. wanted. Not not that you particularly might want to. No. Seems like a pretty crazy thing to do. Pretty normal, unfortunately. Well. I don't know, man. These salesmen, they could... <laughs> let's not go there. So let, let's work on the our will or our responsibility on a place and go from there. Okay, so, so you, can, you can deal with your area. Now, if you, like, identify its boundaries, you can go to Google, Google Earth and... Uh, take a picture of it, satellite picture, right. and draw your boundaries all the way around your property. And you've got a map with the boundaries of your property drawn on it. And you've got a legal right to do what you want to do within that property. So if you want to sprinkle it with pixie dust, it's your right to do that. That's right. So You might get... You might get a few looks from the neighbors, but who cares? Well, the county or the state or the feds aren't going to bother you with pixie no, dust. <laughs> no, they're not going to bother your neighbor <coughs> if he sprays this god awful chemical, Toxic. whatever yeah. it is, yeah. without taking regard to his own self protection. Yeah. 
We call you know, that. If he uh, does it without a spacesuit on, then he shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. Yeah. We call that chemical trespass. Well, he's trespassing himself if he doesn't wear a spacesuit to do well. it. All right. So <clears throat> I've know, got. I mean, so we've got the land. We've got the plat. We've identified it on Google Earth. Yeah. And we so, want it to rain. We we need moisture. Okay. Of some kind. It could be dew or it could be something else, but we need to break this drought. Well, this is the thing. Everything you do needs to be consistent with that aim. Okay. So it wouldn't matter, you know, whether you you know, you where you graze your cows influences things. Uh Yeah, your land management makes a big difference in the health and vitality of your farm. And it's, uh, it becomes real noticeable when you start to take notice of it. Mm -hmm. It'll change the way you go about it. See, with these, with these preparations, you can really have an influence on what's working on your farm. Uh, and two of the biggest things are silicon and nitrogen. They're like opposites of each other. See, carbon and silicon are nonpolar and nitrogen is, well, it's the first anion in the periodic table, and it is extremely sensitive. So when there's, there's moisture in the atmosphere, but it isn't raining, is that, a, it's, is that order or disorder, or what is that? It's just a different order? Well, okay, the moisture in the atmosphere if it were organized, it would make puffy clouds, and the stronger the organization would be based on the strength of the boundaries of the clouds. So when you see clouds that have got very, like, definite boundaries... Like Nimbus. Clip. Well, I suppose the biggest ones are your cumulus clouds. Cumulus. Uh, but and they can be columns, and the so organization they're really coming, is, they're creating or, uh, uh, intense order. In yeah, an intensity, yeah, mm -hmm. so intense that the water will crystallize inside of them, and then you might have a hailstorm. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's like that sort of cloud is really sucking. And it's so powerful, you don't want to go anywhere near it in an airplane. Certainly not in a light airport plane. No, I flew with my dad, and we yeah, you we go didn't around go. We those, navigated around you those. You bet. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so basically, uh, you you're not really aiming at. Uh, the organization becoming so so violent as that okay. that you get a hailstorm. Okay. Uh, if the organization like doesn't have to struggle so much to become concentrated, as it will become concentrated. But if you've got a lot of scattered clouds that are raining throughout the day, then it's a uh, it's a different kind of rainfall. <clears throat> so, on our places, can we somehow influence the order that we're talking about to actually encourage rain and or dew or moisture? Well, you want to connect in with what's happening in nature. And the truth of the matter is, you don't know a fraction of it hardly. No. 
correct. I know nothing every day I wake up. <laughs> well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's helpful to know that you don't know. Yeah. That's a big start. Good, uh, humble so, point to start the day with. Yeah. <laughs> but basically, what I do as a general practice is I frame this in the intent that goes like this. If it be thy will, let the powers of nature converge to increase and enhance beneficial energies and to transform any detrimental energies into beneficial ones within the boundaries as marked for now and in the future for as long as is appropriate because that gives you fourth dimensional boundaries and in deep gratitude because nature responds to gratitude as a feeling uh, Acknowledgement and yeah, gratitude. It's, it's yeah. It's like nature then uh, if, is in love with you and responds to that vibration. You might say. When I try to explain what we're doing, I ask people if they've ever been in love and shared between another person that intense exchange. And then once they grasp that and acknowledge that, yes, I've been in love, I say, well, when you direct that to another person, that's a powerful thing. And, but when you direct that to plants or animals or to your place or to the air even or whatever, there's a, it matters. It has an effect. That too spooky? No, that's dead on. Okay. And I reckon that's what we mean in quantum physics, that you find what you look for. It's just a fact that what you are looking for you find. is what you're going to find. Okay. And that translates in a farmer's world into manage for what you want don't try to manage what you don't want. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, if you find yourself focusing your attention on those things that you don't want, then you're having what you don't want. So let's get back to so you got to, you've got to figure out how what it's going to take to focus your intention on what you want. Okay, so let's go there for drought. Yeah, so, so if, if you're thinking drought, think of, as of the bigger picture around you because that informs your personal picture. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things that in a drought that's like a general drought in your area, there's a lot of things going on. You're only one part of that picture. Okay. But if you, by the things that you do in managing your property, for instance, uh, letting your hay field go to seed, because that's the natural time to make the best seed if you have got enough uh, fertility in the soil to feed that then you'll make the best seed in a dry year because the seed is like the recrystallization of the plant mm -hmm. and that proceeds the best under those warmth and light conditions so all of those stewardship practices are the foundation of making uh, or encouraging order, that's where you're going? Yeah, but you know you're looking for rain. Okay. But you don't know how much rain is really beneficial for you. Okay. And how much you might be turning your back on opportunity as well. 
so it's it's like you don't want to be attached. You want to have a sense of humor about this. <laughs> okay. You know? That sense of humor is enormously important because then you're managing for what you want. Mm -hmm. So you're in a drought, you manage for the drought. And if your place is a little bit more organized than the ones around it, then it will be the nucleus of breaking the drought because it's the seed of the new pattern, which is not a drought. So you do those things during that drought that would be the best practices for drought. Mm -hmm. You spoke of uh, the preparations, but also the rhythms of when to apply them and also the lunar or monthly rhythms that you would tie together to time your application to encourage the creation of the order and go go there, go there. Yeah, well, I, uh, I had traveled up from uh, the southeast Queensland area, uh, north of Brisbane. I had traveled up into the far north uh, <coughs> on the Atherton Tableland and along the coast in Tully and Innisfail and whatnot. And I'd been gone for a couple of months. And when I came back, Graham Sate, who had a farm there in Kenilworth in his area, he had, he was in the middle of a drought. And he said, Hugh Lovell, he said, didn't you say you knew how to make rain? <laughs> <laughs> and he said he's, he explained to me that the condition they were in in the drought and I took my pendulum out of my pocket and I asked how long will it take to break the drought and the answer I got was that the drought wouldn't break for another two weeks uh, until full moon. That nothing I could do would get it to break in that period of time. Oh. But it, I could get it to rain right after that, and right at the full moon, then I could set it up to rain, which is what I did. And it rained. The drought broke with that. And I did a procedure using a map of his place with the boundaries drawn on it. And using radionic gear to transfer the pattern because the map is a sort of a holographic connection with the actual property. Mm -hmm. And so with quantum entanglement, then the property is entangled with the map. So if I'm uh, projecting a pattern of energy on that map, and that pattern of energy was the horn manure or the horn silica or both, or even including the horn clay, that I could broadcast all of those patterns to the map and the map by its entanglement with the field itself, it would connect the, those preparation patterns to the land. And this took morning and evening applications. So the way to start off with this is on the afternoon side of things when the, the dew is ready to fall. So that's a natural cycle. So that at that time, the forces that condense the moisture in the atmosphere are strongest. So you, you 
would stir that and apply that to help, to encourage the organization. Yes. Now, if I use this preparation without the stirring, then it could be much more convenient. Oh, that's the radionic. So aspect. that's that was why using the radionics to do this. Folks are going to have to look up radionics, but ah uh, well. Look, yeah, I don't want to, my book, I don't want to throw us of off into that. So, and then, so what about in the morning? Then? Well, uh, so you put this pattern of the horn manure out in the evening, about the time the dew is ready to settle. And then in the morning, there is also, just before sunrise, there is a second. Uh, sort of condensation of the moisture in the atmosphere and a dew fall. And then when the sun comes up, that burns off. Or is absorbed, too. Or is absorbed, yeah. depending on what's there and what can gather it in. Because there are certain types of plants, like the Fuller's Teasel, that collects moisture in cups around its stem. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's various strategies. And I was describing to you one I saw was a plant we called flatweed. Looks like a dandelion. And it is thriving in the middle of a drought where it hadn't rained for over six months. And it was merrily making blossoms and seeds and as green as green. So this plant had evolved to understand when it could get harvest the dew on both sides of the day to grow, would you say? Yeah, that? yeah, well, the way it worked, I, I clipped one off with my shovel, and I did it right at the surface because the ground was so hard that I couldn't get the shovel in. But I popped it off right under its leaf whorl and flipped it over, and you know, it had slugs living in the leaf whorl. Slugs? Slugs, you know, slimy, moist uh, creatures without a shell. They're usually they're like snails. They operate in a very moist environment, typically. Oh, yeah. They're, well, it was a moist environment around this uh, plant's root. In parched desert. It was, you know, no, it was scorched really dry. Yeah. Uh, what we call Bermuda grass in the States, they call cooch grass there. Yeah. But it was just dried up and waiting for a rain. It so wasn't, we're talking wasn't about a growing. relationship here. Yeah, well, this plant had, had these slugs living in its leaf whorl and feeding on its decayed material and, in turn, feeding it. Symbiosis. Oh, yeah, it was like a happy marriage. And Used, uh, In this little... Realm yeah, of just, water just just from right around do yeah, yeah well you could see you know how snails and slugs will leave a sort of a slime trail yeah and it'll dry up and it'll glisten and you can see it well i was watching and and every one of these plants that was doing so well had these little slime trails out there around it where the slugs had gone out at night and drunk the dew and come back and peed on the plant. Used what they needed and brought the plant. Oh, yeah. Well, the plant had plenty of moisture. That was obvious. So, this was just harvesting dew. So we're talking about using the 500 horn manure in the evening Yep. during that more peak exchange of, or that time of order when there's due, right, or whatever, and then using the 501, the silica, to encourage order on that part of the day. Is that right? Well, we go back to the fundamental nature of, they see the chemistry of things on the vertical axis is carbon and silicon, but on the horizontal axis is calcium and nitrogen. And it's not just calcium, it's every cation. It's aluminum. It's, you know, it's 
uh, it's a lot of different metallic elements, basically. Okay. When, it, when it gets into enzyme processes, then you get into the transition metals that we recognize as metals, but uh, calcium is a metal. Like gold, silver, copper. Oh yeah, all that. But you're you're saying these others are are metals as well. Yeah, calcium and magnesium are metals. That's right. Potassium, and sodium are metals. Okay, so how's that applied to what we're doing? Well. They are the about 2% of our body chemistry. But they provide, you might say, the anchor, you know, the weight of the body. Like, for instance, your bone cells, everyone's bone cells, are hexagonal crystals filled with calcium. So bone cells are actually living silica cells and depending it's, on how you look at it a chemist might say that that's amorphous fluid silica so silica is kind of a highway can you say that it forms the connective tissue though the cell walls mm -hmm. so a bone cell its cell walls are really pretty rich in silica, enough to where it gets that hexagonal crystal shape. Bone cells have are hexagonal crystals. And this is the transfer of substances and forces, too? Or? Yeah, well, you've got a concentration of both forces, see? Both of the, the activity of silicon and the activity of calcium and magnesium, but primarily calcium. So the, you might say the silica is holding the calcium and the magnesium in the bones. Okay, bring this to, into. Well, the most effective medication for osteoporosis is a silica treatment. which makes perfect sense in the chemistry of this, the bone cells. Mm -hmm. That without having a strong enough silica patterning, then it doesn't hold the calcium in the bones anymore. So what's lacking in the atmosphere to bring moisture is that silica organization or the organization of oh, the, the silica? The organization of silica is really at work in the atmosphere with warmth and light. Now, warmth and light are these forces that we see in the atmosphere. If you check it out, then the warmth is coming off the pavement. It's coming off of bare soil. It's coming off of bare rocks. That's, there, that's where it's hot. It's hot uh, in the summer on the hood of your pickup truck. It could have been sitting there all day, but it's hot because the warmth is moving upward from wherever the sun hit the surface of the earth. So if you were a bird that, like a buzzard, or that uh, flew on those rising the thermals. thermals. The thermals? Yeah. 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 And that's where the moisture goes, is it goes up those rising th thermals. So any evaporation off, the off of an area is going to go up those, you might say, vents into a cooler upper layer of the atmosphere. Would you consider that disorder? No, that's, that's the origin of order. That's the beginning that's, of order. That's where the, the beginning of order. where the order like enters into our world. Okay. So... That's organizing moisture in the atmosphere by sucking the moisture up this warm, like, column or vent that, in the atmosphere. And silica's in that. And silica, silica may be in there. Uh, silica well, is the finest dust in the atmosphere. So, wait, when we spray the silica prop, the horn silica, 
Are we encouraging that order in that way? Well, yes. More than I think it, that is clearly realized. But maybe we have to find better ways of measuring it, too. Uh -huh. But the organization that we produce by taking something that spent the whole summer in a cow's horn, buried in a prominent place where warmth and light are rich, mm -hmm. uh, just as in my picture here is, is a sort of a prominent spot with red clay soil and those uh, horns there in the bottom on that left-hand side are full of horn silica. And to bury them in that kind of place and to have that warmth and light that are rising up from the earth into the atmosphere that these horns are resonating in that field of energy. And this aligns the molecules, I have no doubt, of the silica uh, crystals, these tiny silica particles that have been ground up and placed in these horns. And put into a water. Yeah, you have to you have to moisten it to uh, to get it into the horn and whatever. And to get it into but, the atmosphere too. Well, if you then take a small amount of that and stir it up in water and impart its patterning to the water and spray the water, then the early morning time is the best time to do this in the summer. But in the winter, what we don't realize is the warmth and light have receded into the earth. So we've actually got, we've got uh, warmth and light enriching the soil at that time of year. So the warmth and light join up with the chemistry and the life of the soil. And what happens, especially in fertile soils, is the life of the soil is the, what we call the soil food web. Mm -hmm. Because it's an interaction of a wide array of different kinds of organisms. So this gives us a concentrated substance that we can focus at different other times of the year to encourage certain therapies or certain bringing things into balance that are out of balance. I reckon since the warmth and light are working within the earth in the winter, that we should be spraying the horn silica on the earth in winter and let its influences work into the earth along with the warmth and light. So in autumn, I would be out there with the leaf fall spraying my horn manure and my horn silica together yeah. along with horn clay. And so with the idea of encouraging flows uh, or creating order to encourage rain and or dew or some kind of atmospheric moisture to fall on your farm, you would do uh, sequential spraying is what you call it. Is that right? Yeah, that's what I did. And I thought, why shouldn't I just do that every day? So I kept a log and started early in the year, maybe in January, and every morning when I got up before breakfast, then I set up a radionic treatment. With, with 501? Hor with horn silica mm -hmm. or the horsetail decoction. Okay. The silica and gesture, we might call yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. The, the horsetail is a lot milder. It's not as seasonal as the... 
uh, horn silica. Well, it's a whole plant. Yeah. Not a not a concentrated mineral. Yeah, it's a decoction of that herb. Okay. But uh, so you do that in the morning. So I do one of those in the morning. And then alternate mornings, and in the evening I would do the horn manure and the barrel compost. And so I'd alternate them. So as a sequential spray, I didn't actually spray, I just took the map of my farm and did this radionically. And so you did that each day for a period, a certain amount of time, in what, and also in another rhythm you, you mentioned. You mentioned uh, well, the it, moon being in a particular relationship. Yeah, I didn't. I just kept a log that told me when these things were, and I could look at an ephemeris and see where the moon was, even if I wasn't taking note of it. Yeah. But because I had the time and place, then I could go back and translate to that and see what the position of the moon had been in any of these instances. So at first you're just doing it to understand when it was most effective, right? Yeah, well, just to get a sense of, you know, what's going on. Yeah. I mean, if you don't experiment, well then what are you going to find out? Of course, yeah. So, so it wasn't uh, a particularly structured experiment except I simply kept a log. Yeah. And then out of that, you yeah. were able to determine that somewhere around a full moon, or oh, well, with the moon in a particular rhythm, was most effective. Is that oh, right? it always rains more right around full moon, and rains the least at new moon. Okay, so that uh, that's that's a monthly cycle, and it it's another sign that these etheric flows that biodynamics uh, harvest. Yeah, there's, there's not as much understanding as I'd like to see out there. Yeah. But biodynamics is at least a way of getting your head around these things and actually working with them. Because when you have the flow going this way, then you want to go with the flow. Yeah. That's, that's going to be the easiest and best <coughs> and most efficient and, and the best results in everything. What I'd like to emphasize for folks watching this is that you've been able to venture into these, all these different scientific fields and ways of looking at things. And not everybody can do that, Hugh. I, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but... What they can do is uh, try these things on a, diff on a more base level maybe and see if they work for them. And I, 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 you know, at the ranch we make all the preparations. Sure. But not everybody even has to do that to try no. this because we've done our homework and you've done your homework. And what I like about what you've done is bring it in and through the sciences to explain these phenomena uh, and that they do in fact uh, work. Well, we know that because we're using it. I don't understand what you understand. I can't put together, that's why you're here sharing this. But I want people to understand that they maybe first need to let go of maybe how they've been schooled a little bit, to just try some of these things. And they can, they can find the preparations from us or from other places. Uh, and uh, you can go to Biodynamic Source, which is our company with Lloyd uh, Nelson, and you can buy these things that we've made. And just like you go to the co-op and buy a chemical, you can come to us or, and or JPI in Virginia or these other uh, groups that make the preparations and we have instructions and you can just try them and see how see it you know like you said it's an experiment and at first you shake in your own head about well I'm gonna stir this and you know 
you might think it's fairy dust, but there is a science behind it, and there is a, uh, it works or it doesn't, and you and you need to figure that out personally. Well, right? basically, you have to give it a good try because uh, unless you're really cluey to begin with, you probably don't know what your land needs. Yeah, good point. Uh, and to find out what your land is telling you it needs may take you many years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we uh, were 16 years on our place, and we started, like I said, we started to make these more physical and uh, horizontal moves of good sound organic this and that and and rotating the cattle and doing all these things that I can you know knock on wood and and understand and then it, we began to know that that wasn't enough we were bringing things out of degradation but we weren't really kicking the whole thing off and then so as soon as we started to let go and try these other things biodynamics and other things and begin to learn this new language, I'll call it a metal language, and begin to diagnose the imbalances or balances, we could begin to articulate these therapies, these preparations in certain times, and <clears throat> we began to see the life just take off. And so um, I just, what we've been doing here the last, I don't know how many hours now, <laughs> is talking about the science behind and the, the uh, I guess, behind these things. And that uh, it isn't spacey and it isn't uh, spooky and it is something that has a sound scientific basis behind it. And it right, but, but I hope people don't misunderstand that biodynamics is not a true believer system. Oh, it either works or it doesn't work. Yeah, uh, it, we use it because it works, and we use we use it and a whole lot of other things besides yes, that work. That's right. Uh, and it's not a silver bullet either. Oh no, that's where you're going, I think. No, but but no, you still you still have to put up a good fence if you want a fence. That's right. You know. You still have to put your hay in the barn if you want good hay. We need good physical horizontal structures and methods, but on top of that, we can bring in the vertical, so to speak, and kick right. things off the, on a whole different level. The imagine this was the whole idea in biodynamics. Uh, Aaron Fried Pfeiffer on a ride with Rudolf Steiner, who spent a lot of time on trains, he asked him, he said, why is it that people show so little evidence of spiritual progress despite all your efforts? And Steiner surprised him. He said, this is a problem of nutrition that foods available today do not have the forces necessary to build a bridge between the will and the imagination. So, in other words, the food that's available to us today is not triggering in us the full potential of our perception the perception we could have and the the understanding we could have and so we're kind of being dumbed down by dumb food in a way there's the lack of intelligence in the system it, it translates to a lack of intelligence or in us could you say that well i could but then you have to acknowledge that the heart is uh, one of the most massive nerve centers in our body and just think, what is it that connects our will and our imagination? Between our guts and our head is our heart. Yeah. And our agriculture today doesn't have a heart. It's heartless. 
It is the most murderous, poisonous kind of thing. This is a separation. Uh, you might take back to Descartes and Bacon and and even what uh, Galileo, I guess, in the beginning of science when we separated fact and fiction and we separated uh, myth from what became science. Before they were interwoven and there was a kind of a beautiful synergy there. Yeah, and alchemy looked at things from a viewpoint of seeing unseen. The whole. Yeah, it was a holistic approach. Uh, but chemistry just looked at the physical substance. It's uh, Steiner, who actually, my, one of my favorite quotes of his, is that chemistry is the corpse. Chemistry is the corpse of alchemy. Yeah, well, that's well, probably as good a description as you need. In other words, we took alchemy, which was this whole idea and uh, understanding of things, and we went chemistry, biology, right? And you know, we divided everything up. And chemistry is just a part of what well, alchemy used to consider. Well, then you start to think about such things as the biochemistry of the soil. Yeah. And it's bloody complex. Uh, we don't really have a characterization of the molecular structure of humic acid. What are the common features that make it uh, effective humic acid? We really have not got a characterization of that. Well, that's because we keep subdividing it and dividing it and trying to understand it instead well, of... Yeah, well, we can't... It's messy, isn't it? It's a messy vitality. We, to, yeah, well, that's it. Yeah. Because Because if we, if we characterize a molecular structure, it's no longer alive. To kill it. We turn it into a noun well, it, instead of a verb. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's exactly right. It's, it becomes a substance rather than an activity. A living thing. A phenomenon. Yeah, yeah well, so it's, you know, process. Mm -hmm. Dynamics. Yeah, there's the dynamics. You know, there's fourth dimension to things. Yeah. Uh, how can and, how and, can we uh, how can we wrap this up? Well, I don't know. Rainmaking is simple. See, when you realize that you can <laughs> can uh, it's like pumping the organization over your farm up, like you were, you know, on a swing set in and, the evening and yeah, in the morning with those two preps. Right. You you get to start off. You back up as far as you can on your tippy tippy toes and you jump off backwards and pull on the chains and go down as fast as you can to see how high you can go on the upswing. <laughs> and at the upswing, you pull those chains again to get a little bit higher and to go faster on the downswing so that you know, and it's like, it's like building up the organization in your locality, just, just like building yourself up on a swing set. You know, we, uh, we do this work. I think work. you'll stop before you go over the top. Yeah. We do this work and things happen. We have, it can rain on our place and not any, anywhere around us. Now. Yeah. People stop by and say certain things, how they feel, and we get remarks, other forms of data, like flavor and other things. And <clears throat> so I just write things down. I'm not about to say, well, that's because of this or that's because of that. But there's coincidence. Yeah, well, there's a little... Then there's coincidence. Yeah, well, there's a little bit more than that, you know? Well, the story of the luck, lucky farmer is he knows how to make his luck. He knows how to orga organize things. Yeah, now organizational energy flows from lower concentration to higher concentration. 
If it didn't, it wouldn't be organizational. So you can count on it. The disorganizational energy is flowing into dispersion and waste and yep. whatever. Yep. But the Disorder. organizational energy is flowing in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. So and, and if that's you what your have neighbor got, calls that's what your neighbor calls luck. Yeah. Yeah, because because then if it's going to get organized, then it's going to flow to your place yeah. because it's the most organized place and its organization is going to build in the most organized place. I can tell you this that in the last especially <coughs> 5 6 7 8 years We've watched more and diverse insect populations coming in. And I don't mean infestations. I just mean they're in balance. They're there. But yep. Things we've never seen before. There's more diversity of plant life, and there's more birds and that kind of life coming in. And if you it's cut we your... It's like we created a sanctuary and... They don't like it out there necessarily because it's being poisoned. I don't know what, but it, it is this attraction of oil. Well, you'd I guess. get to the point to where when you cut your hay, there were grasshoppers everywhere and fed the trout in the creek. Yeah, yeah. And you had an ecosystem that was really rich. Well. Because if that grasshopper went in the creek and there wasn't any trout there, then it just washes down, you know, where's it going? It's going... To the ocean. Yeah, it's to going to the it, ocean, yeah. going going to Baja California or something. Yeah. So we, uh, we've encouraged on the place some kind of dynamic attraction. Yeah, and that is itself a powerful attraction. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I've uh, funded self-funded the soil test i have <laughs> through these years because those who have trouble with what we're doing and how we're getting the flavor and the yeah the, but you know what we really need to mention is the bison soil activator that we've made up yeah okay that that really needs to be mentioned all right. Because these biodynamic preparations are like each of them is a different instrument in the orchestra. Okay. So some are in the strings and some are in the brass and the woodwinds and timpani and so forth. Yeah. Uh, so you've really got a complement of different say, organs. You know, organs are organized. Yeah, right. Uh, right. You've got, got a, a, a system of organs playing in your farm. And they're interacting. The liver and the kidneys and are interacting. This is the foundation of... Of a biodynamic farm. Which is it's a living organism. Whole see? farm individuality is what Steiner called that. Yeah, and okay. it needs to have these organs it needs its lungs and it needs its uh heart and when, it needs its central nervous system and its sex organs and all the rest of this so uh, let's do quick if uh, what would be the uh, correspondence there soil would be what in the human organism how, what, how would you call that is that the lungs or is that the liver what is it no it has to be organized into that okay okay uh yeah, it's it's part of it. So what about the cows? Are they can we can we can we do that kind of direct course? Cows look their digestion. Aren't look, they? if you could imagine the farm organism as if it was you. Yep. But buried up to your diaphragm in the soil. My head in the ground. And everything yeah, your head in underground. All your sense organs underground, except your feeling out here. Okay. And, uh, yeah, you'd be listening to the music in the soil. Mm hmm You know, it's like chemistry is music, 
and yeah. there's always a chemistry going on in the soil if there's any moisture whatsoever. And you'd be listening to that. Uh, so have you ever put yeah, those together? You're like, you're like the, 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 the organism has to breathe from its mouth underground. Yeah. But its lungs, its, uh, its counterpart to the combustion activity of you as an animal, it's dealing with the chemistry and photosynthesis in the leaf that's building all of this complex chemistry. So that's, that's the leaves are the meat and potatoes of the plant, so to speak. So, okay. so but, but see, see your guts, it would be above this, the diaphragm. Your kidneys would be above the diaphragm. Your liver would be below the diaphragm. Mm -hmm. Your lungs would be below the diaphragm. So soil is lungs? Yeah. I'm trying to... And when, and when Rudolf Steiner mentioned in his agriculture course that legumes are the lungs of the soil, mm. it shows you their importance because they bring oxygen into the soil. Everyone talks about legumes as though they fix nitrogen. Yeah. But they don't. Sorry, folks. Well, not it's alone the, anyway. That's right. They're great hosts for certain kinds of nitrogen-fixing bacteria called rhizobia. And those rhizobia may form nodules on their roots. And this is something they love. The, the, but basically what the legume is doing is it's drawing oxygen into the soil mm -hmm. and excreting it around its roots to feed as oxalic those, acid. To feed those microbes. Well, it yeah. unlocks the calcium and magnesium and other cations in the soil. Makes them available. So it makes all of those, all of that, you know, metallic cation complex in the soil available. And since aluminum is a plus three and it reacts with silicon to form clay, then aluminum is not really available to the plant as a cation. So you brought up the orchestra and you brought up the, the yeah. buffalo soil activator and so, field spray that we're making. So now you take all of your preparations together <laughs> right. as a complex right. and do this with bison manure since that was the that was the animal that built the fertility in these soils in North in, America. Yeah, in North America. Yeah. So, sounds like a good choice to me anyway. Okay. Uh, what excites you about this? Well, you know, you had me checking these out with my pendulum to yeah. see whether... Uh, Their I vitality. They, they, yeah, they had a good response and without seeing the label or anything. And so I doused uh, many different preparations. That's right. And when I got to that one, I got such a swing with my pendulum I called it a helicopter which would be which would have been I'm, I was good excitement over that one <laughs> <laughs> okay but what is it about that that uh, you think is beneficial and well it's all of the instruments in the orchestra playing in concert so when we put that in water and put it yeah. out on the land I think it's oh, it's just We're tuning everything up. Yeah, yeah. Water is the medium for sound, just incidentally for chemistry, and it's got a great memory for patterns. And it's just what a medium to spread these patterns of these things in the horns. But the bison soil activator, as I understand it, it's a bison manure compost that is impregnated with each of these preparations. And then uh, some. And, yeah, and horn <laughs> clay and so forth, esophageal clay. Yep. Uh, um, 
so that every organ of the farm is part of that pattern. Every, you might say, musical instrument is part of that concert. And so when we use that, we... Well, then all of the patterns in nature start to hum. Okay. Then you really start to get a flow of etheric energy, organizational energy. We're getting good reports back from people using it. I'd like to give you some to take I'd home love and to, play I'd with. I'd love to have too. some, yeah. yeah. Even though I live in a forest. That's all. Uh, I guess, you know... You're you're Present still in North bison. America, aren't you? Oh, yeah. Weren't there bison down there? Oh, it was bison. Sure. They ran over the whole place. Yeah. They were a pretty important animal, actually. Let's uh, they, let's try to put a wrap on this. I want to, uh, again, promote your book, uh, Quantum Agriculture, uh, Biodynamics and Beyond by Hugh Lovell. And what's your other... Your earlier book was called What Is... It, it, it was entitled A Biodynamic Farm, okay. not to indicate it was the quintessential biodynamic farm, just like the biodynamic farm, an example. but just a biodynamic farm. Okay. And that's how you learned and went through different stages of implementing this as a oh, sure. stewardship practice. Oh, I started out making the worst of mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> like raw yeah. manure for one. Oh, raw manure was a real bad mistake. <laughs> uh, but uh, Hugh, they can find you on the internet. Is it quantumagriculture.com? Yeah, or? it's uh, www.quantumagriculture.com. Okay. And uh, so, you... so we sell this book. It's also on Amazon. Okay. And. But we ship it. So. But also you consult. And I don't know that you're looking for more work, but... Not really, but... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm curious to see what shows up because I, my approach is I try to meet needs, and if it's needed, then I'll try to do it. Okay. They can find <laughs> you there. That's the best source there on the Internet. Yeah, on the Internet. And through that website. Yeah, and, and email you or that'll you'll get my wife's email. Okay, and she'll forward things to me. All right, and uh, uh, seems like she didn't forward your that's communication okay. with uh, her in the past. So I didn't know. She's probably protecting. I didn't you. know you had tried to communicate. She was probably protecting you. You, you got knows? a lot going. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, and then also uh, Hugh uh, brought up. Uh, you brought up uh, the Buffalo Soil Activator and Field Spray, which we yeah. make here. And I can't think of a better way to get into biodynamics. To start, yeah. Yeah, I think if you are starting with a new property or starting anew with the property, then it would be the way to start. You just get everything. You know, you've got the full engine, has everything that belongs there. Thank you for that. That... Uh recommendation we uh and you can folks can find that at uh, biodynamicsource.org um, we make it right here in carbondale at uh, sustainable settings ranch and if you want to look at our programs there sustainablesettings.org and i should put a little plug in too we've started medicinal herbs uh which are the apothecaries are saying are three, four times the potency in the expression of the aromatics and the oils, healing oils. Uh, but that's uh, biodynamic botanicals, and and uh, so you can find us there. And I think we'll call that a, call that a show. Thanks for coming. Okay, it's been make, incredible. Make sure you use that steam nettle preparation on your medicinal herbs. All right, we will try it because that. <laughs> <laughs> that will ensure that they're top of the potential. Okay. Thank you, uh, Grassroots, for hosting, and uh, we'll see you next time. This program is underwritten by Sustainable Settings, a nonprofit organization devoted to harvesting nature's intelligence. 
in its research and demonstration of sustainable human settlement. Sustainable Settings is supported by volunteering, the sale of our organic farm products, and your tax-deductible donation. Call 970-963-6107 and visit us on the web at www.sustainablesettings.org. <laughs>